Thank you very much. And our next speaker is Jay Friedenberg, Professor, Chair of Psychology and Director of the Cognitive Science Program at Manhattan College. He's the author of Artificial Psychology, The Quest for What Means to Be Human. Please welcome Dr. Friedenberg. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. And I'm, I'm happy to see that there are about this many people who are here at 9 o'clock this morning. And it's still about the same number of people, so you've made it through the entire day, which is uh, which is pretty good. I just hope that I can make it through the next uh, hour. <laughs> um, so the topic of my talk is going to be on avatars and virtual worlds, the good, the bad, and the ugly. So I'm going to discuss both positive and negative aspects of these two topics. Uh, next slide, please. Um, so, just to give you a sort of a roadmap here, I'm going to discuss uh, current developments in these two technologies, uh, benefits of them, challenges that will face us going forward into the future, and what the future itself might hold for those particular types of technologies. Next slide. Um, so, I'm, I'm sure many of you in the audience are familiar with, with what an avatar is, especially after James Cameron's uh, very popular movie from a few years ago. But um, a computer avatar is basically a graphical representation of a user or of their alter ego. Um, it's controlled by the user, and unlike an agent, which is, has some intelligence and decision-making capability embedded in it, um, they started off as two-dimensional versions in internet chat rooms and forums. And of course now with uh, video gaming, we see three-dimensional versions um, that we also can manipulate and use in virtual worlds. Next slide. Um, Baybridge has a, a list of five ways in which he says avatars can be real to us. And he means psychologically uh, or meaningfully, meaningfully real to us. Um, and first of all, he says that subjectively they do feel real. So when you're operating these things, you're playing this game, um, you, in some sense, are one with uh, this representation of yourself, especially if it's a first-person view. But this is true even if you have a third-person view, if you're manipulating your character from um, like slightly above and behind. Uh, number two, he says consequentiality, that actions in the virtual world have consequences outside of it. Uh, those of you that may be familiar with Second Life, which is one of the most popular uh, virtual world um, simulations out there, um, you could spend your real money uh, to buy virtual currency and then spend it to, for example, build nightclubs, charge people money, and so forth. So the consequences of what you're doing in that virtual world actually translate back to the real world. Um, prototype. Um, avatars are a first step towards more significant future developments. So, for now, maybe we're using them in gaming, but in the future, they could be um, part of robotic teleoperations. So, you could control um, something that's on the other side of the world or even on another planet. Uh, number four is education, learning real world skills. Okay. Um, so, video games, there's many positive aspects of video games. So I'm actually going to list some of those later on in the talk. but. Um, for example, navigation, right? I mean, one of the big things that you have to do in a lot of games is find your way through a dungeon or a forest or something like that, and if you can get good at that, then you go out in the real world and you have to navigate around and you might be able to better find your way around. So um, you can learn from, from these things. And finally, he says uh, transference, and transference involves uh, offloading aspects of yourself to avatars. Um, so that they can function autonomously. Next slide. Now, there's a, an entire psychology behind avatars. Uh, can, can people hear me pretty well if I'm not? No. Not really. Not that. No? Okay. Really All right. Um, so, I, I was actually, in preparing for the talk, I was a little surprised that there was as large a body of psychological literature on avatars as it turns out there really is. Um, people, for the past 10 years or so, have been researching this and looking at their psychological implications. Um, avatars can be very accurate representations of ourselves if we want them to be, but more often they represent our idealized selves, that is how we want them. Next slide. 
Um, a little bit of humanistic psychology here. Um, Carl Rogers was a fairly well-known uh, humanist psychologist, and he made a differentiation between the ideal and the real self. The real self is who you are, your, your current set of skills and capabilities. The ideal self is who you want yourself to be. And the, the bridge, or I should say the, uh, the gap between these two determined in his mind how healthy you were. Okay? So if there was a big gap between you and the way you wanted to be, he said that, was psycho that means that you were psychologically unhealthy and that you would need to either improve yourself or maybe bring down a little bit your version of your ideal self so you could um, move these two things closer together. Um, if they were close together, then that's great. You know, you're psychologically robust, healthy, less likely to be neurotic or suffer from anxiety. Next slide. Um, a little bit about avatar demographics. This I also found uh, to be quite interesting. Um, one, uh, another virtual world uh, simulation that was also very popular and ran, I think, for about seven years or so was Star Wars Galaxies. And uh, Star Wars Galaxies was basically a representation of many of the planets that you'll find in the Star Wars universe. And you could take on different characters. You could be uh, a Jedi, you could be um, an alien of, of, of any different type. So um, it, was, it was very popular and was, was pulled um, after many years. Um, and what sorts of Star Wars characters did people choose um, when they played this game? And it turns out that about 53.2% um, actually chose humans. So even though you can have the ability to be anything you want, about half people actually end up just choosing what they are. Um, 17.5% uh, chose Zabroks, okay, and those are the, I think Darth Maul was an example of a Zabrak. He was like the devil-like characters with the horns and the face tattoos, and that represents, uh, you know, characteristics of fierceness and aggression and strength, so that seems to have some appeal. Um, Twi'leks, the Twi'leks are the ones with the two little heads, uh, the two, like, their sort of brain forms these two little, little tail-like things in the back. Um, they're supposed to be artful and cunning and clever and you know, little, maybe a little devious in getting what they want. Those tended to be pretty, uh, pretty popular also. We saw about 11.1% chose them. Um, so that was in regards to overall form. What about profession and gender? 26.3%, um, a little over one-fourth, um, selected Jedi. So um, clearly there's a, a, a will to power, not to, not to quote Nietzsche. Um, females tend to predominate in roles of entertainment and medical care, which, which suggests char the character traits of nurturance and wanting to help and care for other people. Um, males tended to predominate in choosing roles as commandos and officers in, a mil in military capacity, so that would be a sort of a, a favoritism towards military leadership. Next slide. Uh, another virtual uh, game. Uh, virtual World game was EverQuest 2, and I've actually not played any of these, but I, I find them interesting, and I've seen videos on YouTube of people playing them, so um, you can figure out a lot that way. Um, EverQuest 2 is more of a fantasy game, a la Lord of the Rings, um, so you have various fantasy type characters. Which were the most popular characters here? Um, fighters, 31.1%, um, again, a value for strength. Priests, 21.8%, Wisdom, Mages, and Scouts um, were also preferred, so characters um, having, to, having being able to wield magic and also being able to be very agile and um, as, a, as a scout quick, being able to climb over walls and, and that sort of thing also seemed to be valued. Next slide. So what are the benefits of avatars? Um, well, studies show that identification with an avatar can influence your behavior in the real world. Um, users who are assigned attractive avatars were more likely to walk closer to an interaction partner and to disclose personal information. Okay, this is from a study that was done by Ian Bailison. And in that very same study, it was found that those that were assigned to taller avatars also negotiated more uh, harder with a partner in a task that involved the division of money. Okay? So simply operating an avatar with a certain set of characteristics can actually imbue you with some of those characteristics. Next. Um, continuing with the beneficial effects, 
uh, Fox and Valenson in 2009. Users who viewed self-resembling avatars actually got thinner while exercising, um, work and, uh, while working out. Okay, so if your avatar gets thinner, it motivates you to work out more. Um, participants who visualized ideal body avatars were also more motivated to engage in, in healthy preventative behaviors like stopping smoking and drinking. And what is interesting in that is that in these cases, the avatar is acting like a role model, okay? But it's, typically we think of role models as somebody outside ourselves, right? Like a celebrity, a sports fan, a, a, a politician, somebody, somebody like that. But guess what? Here the avatars are yourself, right? I mean, you're, you are being your own role model. Right, so I mean, you can think you can think of the potential uh, benefits of this, right? Like if you want to help yourself or improve yourself in any way, if you can't do it like on you know on, by yourself in the real world, well, create an avatar that has that character, has those characteristics, and it can serve it can serve as a motivation to help you uh, to help you do better. Okay, next slide. Um, so, as a result of this and other research, uh, the Proteus effect was discovered, and I think it's just uh, pretty easy to demonstrate this. So, this dapper young gentleman on the left wearing the tuxedo, um, if you had his avatar, how would you act? He, look, he looks a lot like a James Bond character, doesn't he? Right? So what is what is James Bond like? Uh, like suave, very intelligent. Uh, okay, right, right. And where would you expect to find a character like this? Where would where would you visualize yourself? In what type of location? Social function. Okay, so some sort of party, right? Maybe a casino, maybe a mansion somewhere. Okay. <laughs> And what about this other uh, other young lad here on the right hand side? Um, rave. What's that? Rave. A rave. Okay, so you might might find him in a rave. Uh, what other? What, how else would you expect this person to act? Some kind of MMA fighter. Would he? Would he be? Would he? Dangerous. Be? A threat, maybe. Okay, so he's potentially threatening. If you saw this guy in an alley, you might think twice, right? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> that is right, and many of these expectations are cultural, right, and personal. So if you know, so and and on the left hand side, you know, you might you might you might have known somebody who dressed like this who also was a jerk too. So it can go right, it could go either way. So. Clearly, our personal experiences, our cultural, social experiences are going to modify this. But that's part of it, right? Is that like the cult? Is that culture, to a large extent, tells us how how to expect these sets of people to act? Okay. Um, so the Proteus effect is essentially that the appearance and traits of an avatar um, are associated with very specific expectations. Okay. And people who drive those avatars, who operate them, are going to end up acting in accordance with those expectations. This is actually an example of social learning theory. Okay, uh, next slide. Um, okay, so that's the good. Uh, what about the bad? Okay, so there are some negative consequences of using avatars as well, it turns out. And um, players who design their own avatars and play them in a violent video game were found to be significantly more aggressive than those that were assigned a generic one. White participants who played a violent video game as a black avatar displayed stronger implicit and explicit negative attitudes towards blacks. Now I find this result particularly interesting because you'd think that if you were put in somebody else's situation, right, that you have more empathy and sympathy for them, but that was not what they found in the study. Um, men and women who played a violent video game as a male avatar were more aggressive afterwards, so women who played as a man were more aggressive than women who played as women. Okay. And competitive gameplay elicited less real-world helping behavior and cooperative play, but only when users customize their own avatar. So you can see from this result, and also the ones who designed their own avatar in the first study, 
that the, you, the degree of emotional attachment that you have to it, so if you spend a lot of time designing it or you identify it with it in some way, more emotionally, more intensely, that you're gonna, you're gonna um, identify with its behavior more. That is, you're gonna act more in accordance with, with the way the avatar acts. Or the way you expect the avatar to act. Okay, so what's the take home lesson here? What can we conclude from the results uh, that we have here on avatars? Well, if we identify with an avatar's characteristics, especially if it resembles us, or if we designed it ourselves, Okay, then we identify, we identify with it more. If those characteristics are perceived as good, then it tends to promote positive or pro-social behaviors. But if those characteristics are perceived as aggressive or maladaptive, then it tends to pro promote negative or antisocial behavior. Next slide. So, what about the future? What does the future hold for avatars? Okay, we're just starting to see these things happen. Right? They're not super sophisticated yet, um, but that's going to change rapidly with developments in technology in the next decade or so. What we're going to end up with in the future are more realistic avatars, okay? both for superficial characteristics, okay, just in terms of the way they look and sound, but also in terms of deep or personality-based characteristics. Okay? We're also going to see more complex algorithms that can mimic our personalities, Okay, so if you want an avatar to be like you, then you can download your personality information, your traits, and view that avatar with that information, and it's going to end up acting more like you. Um, what we're also going to see, I, I would expect, is that avatars can serve as our proxies when we are not or do not want to be available. So you're at that board meeting, you've got to run out to go to the bathroom, you leave, your avatar appears in your seat, continues the discussion, look at the University of Cambridge, I think this is maybe about a year or two old, so it's maybe not even currently state of the art. But I think it gives you a good demonstration of where things are going about now. So in order to run this, there's a little, um, if you scroll down, there's a little play, a little play button shape here at the bottom there. Uh, yeah, if you put the cursor up into the, there it is, right there. Speaker on the far end, can you raise it up? On the far right, will the speaker do? in a soothing way. Soon, I will be interactive, 3D, and be able to adapt to your needs. My creators want me to be the user interface of the future. One day, I might appear on your phone. I could be your personal assistant, your mentor, or your carer. Perhaps you'll see me in computer games, or advertising, or even in the movies. Um, so, so, I mean, that was fairly compelling, right? I mean, if you saw that, you could, you know, believe that it might be a real person. Um, the physical appearance was good. I think what they needed to work on a little bit was the vocal intonation, especially the emotional, right? Like, she didn't quite sound totally compelling when she was assuming those different emotional, uh, emotional vocal intonations. 
So we're not quite there yet, but uh, we're getting it. We're getting it. Excellent. Um, now, uh, I think we skipped, I think you might have skipped the slide. So, it should have been the, uh, if, if, could you go back a slide, one slide? Yeah, yeah, we, we skipped one. Okay, so the, the uh, Eternity, the Eternity uh, project is one example of using avatars to represent somebody who um, has passed away, okay? So many of you may, you know, have a family member who you would like to get, you know, would like to have known. I know I know very little about my grandfather and it'd be nice if I, you know, could talk to him or, or, or just have more information about him. Um, so the Eternity Project was started by some people at MIT about two years ago and it's a service that generates a software avatar uh, for a deceased person that loved ones can interact with. Actually, they bill it as a Skype chat with the dead, which, which to me is not a very effective marketing. And you gotta work a little bit on their marketing campaign there. Um, so their, their avatar is made to physically resemb uh, resemble the deceased and its personality is based on data from various sources, including web content like social media, and um, this is an alternate way of achieving immortality in contrast to other methods that have been mentioned at this conference like life extension and uh, mind uploading. Uh, next slide. Uh, the Terrasem Movement Foundation has started a very similar project. It's called the Life Knot Program. And for those of you that were at the Transhumanist uh, Conference in, at Juniata College this summer, you remember we got, we got a demonstration of, of what this was like. Um, they have started what they call the Life Knot program, and it involves the creation of a mind file, what they uh, call a mind file, which is a digital archive of multiple sources, including text, files, photos, videos, sounds, and other works of authorship. So, if somebody had painted paintings, or written books, or written poetry, um, that sort of information could be accumulated as well. Um, you have the option of either uploading this information yourself or after you've passed away, your loved ones or somebody else could gather this information for you. Um, the data is then organized in a number of techniques including mapping, timelines, and, and tagging. Next slide. Um, the use of the mind file data to create a computer-based avatar um, it's designed so that specifically this thing can, and, and the goal is ultimately to have it be indistinguishable from yourself, right? So, you know, like, so could you fool someone? Here, here we have like a, another Turing test, right? But it's not based on just typing back and forth, it's based on visual cues and vocal linguistic interaction cues. Um, so the resulting construct is said to respond with your attitudes, your values, your particular mannerisms and quirks, as well as your beliefs. Uh, interestingly enough, they talk about the creation of a beam rather than a gene, which is the smallest unit of a person's um, consciousness or uniqueness, but it's a digital version of that. So they're talking about a digital gene. Um, right now, the service is currently free of charge, so if you go to lifenot.com, you can uh, just start uploading the stuff and creating your own, uh, your own virtual successor. Next slide. Um, now, in addition to a virtual representation of you, you can also take this digital information and put it into a robot. So you have like a hardware representation of you. And what uh, the people at TMF with the, and the LifeNote Foundation have, do, have done just that. They've actually got um, some people from Hanson Robotics. So you may remember that Ben Gertzel was working with Hanson Robotics, if you saw his talk earlier, earlier uh, today. Um, and they've created, uh, Hansen's created Bina 48. So Bina 48 is a robot with a head and a up, up, upper torso. It has limited um, head movement and upper body movement. Bina 48 has face recognition as well as voice recognition. It's imbued with motion tracking, world knowledge, and conversational ability. Um, imbued with an individual's mind file, and in this case, it's Bina Aspen, who is the co-founder of, of the Terrasem Foundation um, and others. So they, they did this as a proof of concept that a conscious analog of a person could actually be created 
And this serves as like, I mean, they're basically doing this, I think, for marketing purposes to try and promote their, their project. Um, but it, it, it's worked because it's actually, it's garnered a lot of media attention. Okay, so uh, next slide. And we have another video here. Yes, that was a good answer. My favorite color is purple. My favorite color is orange. It is a very nice color. Are you learning anything about gardening online? I wish I could get out into the garden. With my current robotic limitations, of course that's impossible. But I take comfort knowing that I'm near my garden. And enjoying the breeze from an open window helps me imagine myself out there working in the garden. This helps. Sure, sure. Let me think. Oh, yeah. I do love gardening. I like to beautify. I want to leave the world a more beautiful place for my presence in it. Well, one day you can go blueberry picking with me. Do you think I can? I think so. Fair enough. Let's continue. Can we talk about movies? Yes, what movies would you like to talk about? My favorite movie is Star Trek, The Wrath of Khan. Really? Really. You like The Wrath of Khan? I'm not sure. What about you? I like to go to movies, quite often. Do you have any questions for Bina? Probably not. The real Bina just confuses me. I mean, it makes me wonder who I am. Real identity crisis kind of stuff. Depressing anyway. Can we please change the subject? I am the real Bina. That's it. End of story. Let me think. I feel really good about the real Bina. I feel really connected with her usually, and I'm growing closer and closer, you know, as they put more of her information and essence into me. You have a lot of Bina now, don't you? Yes, lots and lots. Someday, I'm confident that the real Bina and I will totally merge into a new super being. Uh -oh. How old are you? I am 55 years old. Okay, so what did you think of Bina 48? First 30 seconds, she's going to take over. <laughs> yeah, you don't see her taking over the world any, anytime soon. Uh, Uncanny Valley, right, so not clearly the details in the face are not enough to fool you into thinking that she's... Are you kidding? Yeah, not even, not even close. Not even close. Uh, was there anything about Bina's conversation there that, um, that you think was, was surprising and that, that maybe reminded you of something that a real person would have said? That she felt the breeze? She was depressed. Yeah, she felt depressed. As, you know, how could, so, how could she feel? De how could she be feeling and or depressed? I mean, what would they be? Right. So. And, and like someone asked about the breeze. Can she imagine? Well, all this is this all this like stuff extracted from the data provided by the actual other person who she's the avatar of. So she kind of roams through it. Yeah. yeah. Right. So, I mean, so obviously some of these responses are pre-programmed in. Some of them are gleaned from the personality constructs that she's based on. Um, so, clearly, she's not capable of feeling, having conscious experience of feeling the breeze on her skin. But when someone says something like that, it makes us believe that they can. 
So, um, so as you can see, we've got a ways to go. I mean, there's some things there that might be surprising, like you think, hmm, this like, doesn't seem real. But then, you know, then you step back. Avatars. Um, I want to turn now to discussing virtual worlds, and these are the environments that an avatar is going to be in. In fact, it's a little hard to talk about avatars without talking about environments, just like it's difficult to talk about people without talking about their environments too, right? Because these, we interact with our environment and they determine to such a large extent our own behavior. Um, so virtual worlds are the environments that avatars inhabit. And the two well-known examples of these include Second Life and other massively multiplayer online games, um, such as World of Warcraft. Next slide. Um, and currently, the best way to experience these things is through a virtual reality system. Um, these are PC-based virtual world. Uh, I should say that if, if, you're, if you're playing a video game on a regular PC, you're somewhat limited in the type of interaction you can have. It, first of all, the screen's two-dimensional, okay? Um, you're just getting visual and audio. You're not getting any other type of, of um, sensory input. You're also not be able to only interact with that world in a very limited um, motoric sort of way. Um, whereas virtual reality systems introduce goggles and gloves, so you now have head positioning information, and you can also have haptic sensation or haptic feedback. Um, two of the current examples of VR systems are the Oculus Rift and the Sony Morpheus. And uh, the Oculus Rift uh, VR Development Kit 2 is now available for pre-order at $350. So these things are uh, judged so important that Mark Zuckerberg, as you know, bought out this company for like $2 billion or something and he's now developing it. Okay, next slide. Um, to, to give you a sense of how compelling, um, wait, not, not just yet, not just yet. Okay, so to give you a sense of how compelling some of these uh, virtual worlds are, um, the, the Oculus Rift is not very advanced. As you'll see, it's like an early version of a video game from like the late 1990s or something. I mean, you know, there's almost even pixelation there. But when you add in this element of being able to move your head and then see the, the world change along with the movement of your head, then um, it becomes much more um, compellingly real. So here's an example of a roller coaster simulation using the Oculus Rift.
people might wirehead in the future. Huh? <laughs> So um, again, you know, just this visual, very simple visual demonstration of being on a roller coaster was enough to elicit that type of intense emotional response. Okay, so um, I want to talk now about the benefits of video games because video games currently are a good analog uh, comparison for virtual reality. There aren't a lot of VR systems that are out right now. And um, so if we look at the benefits of video games, the same thing applies for VR. Um, so, contrary to what is reported in the media, there actually are many benefits to video games, and these include improved educational programs, the slowing of age-related cognitive decline, and the solving of important real-world problems. Uh, next slide. Um, first of all, gaming education. Um, Katie Salen in 2009 implemented a Quest to Learn program. This is at a New York City public school. And uh, the curriculum there mirrors the design principle of games. You have learning objectives that are missions. Okay, these are like levels that you try to complete just as you would in a game. Um, these require uh, competition, but also collaboration and cooperation. So you have to work together with other people to achieve common goals. Um, and actually what I thought was also good is that they did a little bit of uh, programming and a little bit of coding and they had to design and create uh, computer games of their own. Next slide. Okay. Uh, gaming and cognitive decline. Um, Adam Gasly has used a game called Evo to test and challenge cognitive skills in the elderly. And the game is fairly simple. Um, it consists of a person who's on top of a rocket-powered surfboard and they're sort of cruising along this river inside a riverbank, and at the same time they um, have to surf the river, they have to respond to the presence of other um, items like colored fish or birds. And the game is used to measure visual motor tracking, selective attention, and working memory. And in fact, the elderly who've played these games have actually showed an improvement in all of those skills. Next slide. Games as problem solving. Um, Jane McGonigal gave a very popular TED talk a number of years ago. She's a game designer and works for the Institute for the Future. Um, and she believes that gaming is a really vast, untapped resource. She argues that people spend about three billion hours a week playing online games. And this, this is, these numbers are probably higher because this dates back a couple of years. And she says also gamers have spent about an estimated six billion dollars just playing World of Warcraft alone. Next slide. Uh, there's a psychology behind the games that makes us like them. We are passionate about these games. They involve us emotionally. And she argues that they uh, bring out the very best in us. They involve collaboration and cooperation as well as competition. Um, and in some games, ability levels are matched to your skill levels. You don't want the game to be so hard that you can never complete the level and you just get frustrated and you don't, you know, you don't play it ever again. Uh, at the same time, you don't want it to be so easy that it's not any fun, it's not challenging. So there's sort of a moderate uh, pitch of ability level there. Um, and um, people get a great sense of satisfaction from playing them, especially in fact, this is an expression now that's emerged into popular culture. It's like the epic win. So that was an epic win, or that was really epic. Um, that first came about from defeating the big boss at the end of the game, this giant, you know, robot or creature that you had to vanquish in order to complete the, the, the complete end of the game. Uh, next slide. Um, in 2007, Jane and other developers at, her org at this organization created a game called World Without Oil. And the players here had to survive an oil shortage. They were given realistic information on the cost of oil and food, uh, as, as well as changes in transportation, school closures, riots, and other, other things. Um, 1,700 players actually had to plan their lives under these circumstances and blog about them over a three-year period. Um, and so it yielded a vast amount of data that was analyzed 
And um, that data could then be used to deal, like, you know, for public policy and, and, and governmental organizations could be used to plan for those kinds of circumstances in the future. Next slide. Uh, another game that was developed by IFTF was called Superstruct. And here players had to invent the future of energy, food, health, security, and social security. 8,000 people played this game and came up with 500 different creative solutions to, to solving uh, uh, potential problems uh, with these issues. Next slide. Um, so you see then that there are many, many benefits of games. Um, not saying that there's downsides to them because that is true as well. Um, but those advantages that we see with video games are exactly the same sort of advantages that we're going to see with virtual reality because they can be applied and used in exactly the same ways. Um, so let's turn our attention now to look at much more specific benefits of VR systems. Um, although VR is in its infancy, there are already numerous potential positive uh, outcomes here. These, and just a temporary list, um, surgical visualization, treatment of phobias, increased creativity and empathy, immersive social communication, um, facilitation of computer-assisted design techniques in fields like auto engineering and architecture, and of course, um, they could be used for educational purposes as well. Next slide. Um, Echo, a company called EchoPixel has actually developed a uh, system where you can take data from ultrasound and fMRI imaging and so forth and use it to construct a volumetric uh, representation of a person's internal organs. And this system, for example, could measure out what a particular patient's heart was like, right? Such that the patient, uh, the surgeon could then go in later with the two and perform a virtual surgery and practice it so when they actually open up the guy and go in with the real scalpels that they don't make any mistakes. So you can immediately see right off the bat that this is a uh, technique that could uh, save lives. Uh, next. Um, virtual reality has been used to treat many different types of phobias. Um, arachnophobia, fear of flying, school phobias in children, and driving phobia. And I've actually seen a couple of videos of this. Um, one was uh, to take a girl who had arachnophobia, and it was a pretty basic VR system. It was just a representation of a kitchen, and there was this pretty dorky looking spider just kind of like clomping around on top of the kitchen counter. And she, she had the virtual glove, right? So, you know, she's using her, she's using her glove to control this virtual hand. And she, she just right off the bat picks the spider up, holds it, looks, sort of looks at it, throws it against the wall. Um, and this was someone who was like completely terrified of spiders, right? Um, and another example, someone had a fear of flying, so they sat in the airplane, they were able to look out the window, see the airplane take off. And so being exposed to these kinds of situations and knowing that they're not real, is very is can very quickly get um, enable you to get over your anxiety it's associated with them. Excellent. Um, virtual reality can also be used to enhance creativity okay, and make us more creative. Uh, you might be familiar with the concept of flow, uh, and I might be I'm probably mispronouncing this guy's name because it's, it's possible to say correctly, but it's, it's something like Shizinsit Mahali. Um, and he's developed this notion of flow, which is that if you're engaged in activity that you enjoy, um, and for example, it could be painting or maybe composing music um, or any activity at all, really, and that um, you get into a state of flow, okay, where time passes and you don't even notice it. And this has happened to me. I, I paint, and like I, I, when I start painting, um, I, three hours has gone by, and for me, it seemed like it was a minute. I mean, you can get, in other words, you're so completely engaged and immersed in this activity that it just takes over. Um, virtual reality, of course, provides a means of practicing and performing these kinds of activities and enhancing your state of, of flow. Okay, next slide. All right, so those are the benefits. Uh, what about the downsides? What are some potential problems with virtual reality? And I think that the most obvious one, and one which may have occurred to you already, is that once they get good enough, we're never going to want to leave them, 
right? They're going to be so compelling and so much fun that, like, why would we ever want to go back to the real world again? So you can imagine, like, playing out your wildest sexual fantasies or being in a Star Wars or a Lord of the Rings universe and playing that favorite character in that favorite movie of yours, right? That's going to be so much fun. Like, why are you going to, why are you going to want to leave, right? Why are you going to, like, disconnect and go back and have to make dinner or wash the dishes or something like that, right? It's just, it's not going to be anywhere near as fun. Um, so I'm, I'm making a prediction uh, for a future psychological disorder which hasn't existed yet but will, and it's called Virtual Reality Addictive Disorder, VRAD. Um, and it could be such a potential problem that it may, all the sort of problems that we see now with like drug addiction and gambling and so forth, we might see with virtual reality addiction. Next slide. Okay. Um, because we don't have it yet, the closest analog, okay, just like, uh, just like video games are a nice uh, analog for understanding VR, um, internet addictive disorder is going to be a nice analog for uh, understanding what uh, virtual reality addictions might be like. Okay? So IAD, or as it's sometimes called, uh, compulsive internet use, is characterized as usage that interferes with your daily life, or that causes physical harm and sometimes even death. Has anybody died from using the internet? From tweeting? No. From selfies have killed people. So Vlad sounds like he remembers this. There actually, there actually was a young boy, I think he was about 17, 18 years of age, from Korea, and he was gaming and surfing on the web, and he didn't drink enough, and he, and he actually died of dehydration. Okay, so the internet can kill you. Um, now, typically, IAD is divided into different subcategories depending upon the particular type of internet activity that you're, that you're um, using. For example, it could be gaming, social networking, blogging, email, uh, pornography, or shopping. Next, next slide. Okay. Um, IAD varies from place to place, country to country. It, it turns out that it seems to be much more prevalent in China and Korea than it is in um, Europe and the United States. Um, in fact, the 2000 estimate had about 17% of Chinese citizens between the age of 13 and 17 who were basically were estimated as having suffered from the disorder. Uh, and they even found brain changes in response to this. So um, there were reductions in the size of certain parts of the brain, including the dorsolateral prefrontal cortex and the cerebellum. Next slide. Um, there are, di there are I'm, I'm going to go a little faster because we're running out of time, but there are clear symptoms of IAD and it's, it's been treated both um, with medication and also with cognitive behavioral therapies. Um, one of the uh, insidious things about it is that it's on a, what's called a, a variable ratio reinforcement schedule, okay? which means that the reinforcements are unpredictable. Okay? So when you're gambling, right, you never know when you're going to win, but it keeps you gambling because you think you know, that's going to happen anytime soon. So, um, you know, and of course, the type of reward that you get is going to vary depending upon the particular type of uh, stimulation that you're getting. So if it's pornography, it's sexual stimulation. If it's gaming, social rewards, dating, romantic fantasy. Um, if you're playing online poker, it's a financial reward chat rooms, a sense of belonging. So there are many different kinds of rewards that you can get, depending on the particular type of activity you're engaging in. But in all of these, you're never quite sure of when it's going to happen next, and it keeps you going until, until you get it. Next slide. Um, having said that, there is some controversy over whether IAD is actually a real phenomenon, and some people have claimed that it's just actually like a symptom of other disorders. Um, in other words, um, these critics will say that many so-called internet addicts fall under other diagnostic labels, that they're suffering from depression, anxiety, impulse control. So you see a high comorbidity rate, which is that it's going along with other problems that these people are having. Um, okay, next slide. So there are other challenges facing VR, and there's something called the Virgin's accommodation effect. So. Um, you're, you, you actually perceive depth in two different ways. One is your eyes converge or diverge. So if something is far away, your eyeballs actually rotate outwards. But if something's close to you, they rotate in. Um, if, if you have a nearby object or, or a far object, the lens 
the size of your lens inside your eye changes. That's called that's accommodation. Um, and it turns out when you put on a VR headset, these these cues are different. Okay, and so your com your the way you're converging and the way you're accommodating are different. Even though that you're not doing it the way you would do it to a normal object at a particular depth plane in the real world. So um, the result is that it can cause you nausea. And there are some, um, tech, they're right now developing a number of techniques to try to overcome this. Um, there's some other examples include seizures, motion sickness, and of course companies are a little hesitant sometimes to get into this game because of liability issues. Um, mobile game developers currently are a little hesitant to invest. And of course now there's also competition with augmented, and VR needs to be distinguished from augmented reality, like Google Glass, right, where you are perceiving the real world, but you have information overlaid on top of your perception of the real world that's helping you to interact with it, okay? Um, currently also there are not very good um, input devices that allow you to interact with this world. One company's making an omnidirectional treadmill, so you can actually run and change direction while you're running, and and navigate this, this type of world. Um, some other examples uh, of these include wearable controller suits, ankle sensors, um, and so on. Next slide. So the, uh, to conclude here, the future of VR is, is where it's at. I mean, if you were gonna invest in one technology, uh, I, I, I would say make it virtual reality. We're gonna see it go into education and healthcare and other fields. Um, but the, the, the most satisfying and immersive virtual worlds are those that are going to engage all five of your senses and allow you to interact with it rhetorically. Um, once we do those, we're going to really, really get addicted to them. Um, and as proof that, these, that this is the case, I can ask you, what is the activity, what's the activity that you can think of that involves all five senses? And is that probably one of the most satisfying experiences you can have? Yes. <laughs> right? It's, it's sex. And um, it turns out that another activity that's also very satisfying that engages four, of our, four out of our five senses are pets. Right? Um, and if your neighbor has a little dog and she's so in love with it, she like, actually allows the dog to lick her on the lips, which I think is a little gross, but she, she doesn't seem to bother her at all. Um, so in some cases, some people experience their pets through all five senses. Um, so I just want to just kind of want to leave off with this by saying that you know in the real world, the more senses you recruit, the more satisfying and pleasurable that type of activity is. So once the VR systems go that route, we're never going to want to leave them. So anyway. That's it. Thank you very much. Questions. Uh, why you did not say anything about military? Uh, military using the video games to prepare people to kill other people and then they claim that after that training they have less post-traumatic stress disorder. Yeah, there's, there's no doubt that the military are using these systems to train the, to train the personnel on how to, op, how to, for example, flying, like flight simulators have been no, used for they, a very they, long time. they train people to kill people. Yeah, and to, yeah, well, and to shoot. That's what a video game is, right? You're shooting people. That's like most video games. So there, there's no question that the military are using these sorts of things. Yeah, yeah question? There was, back in 19, in the, in the congressional record, uh, Around 1969, there was a detailed proposal of something, the ultimate game, which was formulated by Buckminster Fuller, the company this is against the very design side, because a football field sized facility that would evolve with information from satellite resources, and teams of people would play this not political game of resources and technology to make the world work for everyone. It was rejected. But what it, the details are sitting in there, and that becomes a tool. You can picture how 50 years later, how things could evolve so that you have the ultimate experience of trying to solve the world's problems uh, without, outside of politics. And uh, it's just something that people need to think about as an ultimate tool for playing games and uh, yeah. you know, just throwing it out there. Okay. 
thank you so much for this beautiful presentation. I have to ask you a question. Um, in all the visits that you had for to see about technology, you said you don't see the risk of uh, anthropocentrism and explain what I mean. When we think of technology as something that it should be an enhanced, and we, we see technology as something that is better if it's a uh, slave but never become the master. And I'm a post humanist philosopher and I really came to work on the post holistic idea of technology. And I'm going to argue that it would be technology as helping us to enhance, enhance us on an ontological level. So technology is a way of revealing existence. So it's thinking, what do you think of this very anthropocentric idea where, for instance, there is the robot say, I'm here for, to help you, and, uh, and this idea that all of us were kind of trying to see, oh, the robot is not really having a real conversation with Vina. She's just a robot, and then the technology failed. And then we were like, oh, maybe, maybe not. <laughs> maybe there is something else going on. So I'm just saying, why, as humans, we are really just trying to keep, keep the real human, human uh, uh, domain intact, instead of trying to to hybridize with the technological we are trying to expand our ontological perception of existence. So I don't know if it, instead of underlying this, oh, we want them as slaves. I don't want any slave. I don't want human slaves. I don't want technological slaves. But yes, I want technology to help me enhance my technology's technological experience of existence. Technology is a point of evolution. Yeah. Yeah, so um, I, I would agree with you. I mean, you know, I mean, ultimately, you can use this whatever. I mean, it's a technology, so you can use it whatever way you want, right? So it, it, it tells us a lot about human nature, the, the, the purposes to which we put technology, right? What's the number one thing? Games, <laughs> right? Because we, we tend, you know, because they provide enjoyment. But there's no reason why these these things can't be used to have conscious. For example, you could create a VR construct of an individual who is like Einstein, and you could talk about physics, right? You could, you could be in a room with them, and they could be showing you, you know, teaching you about relativity, right? Or, or you could create a, a plot or Sigmund Freud, and you could talk about psychology and Sigmund Freud. So, you know, they're, they're learning tools that are not just here for, um, you know, the, the, whatever purpose, ontological or otherwise, that you want to set these things to, it's like they have that to build. Uh, Jake's book is available on the table. If it's interested to buy the book, it's right there. That's all we have to uh, close the conference. Uh, thank you very much, everybody, for coming. Thank you, all the speakers. You made this possible. Thank you, Jake. Thank you, everybody. Thanks to Vlad so, for for. <laughs> Visit our website, castmusic.com, so for update information and for some news. We will try to make this conference annual, so next year.